Mr. Speaker, I rise to make a brief uh, presentation in support of the Barbuda Land Amendment Bill of 2017. Uh, first of all, let me commend the mover for a sterling presentation this morning. As he indicated, he's not quarter Barbudan or half Barbudan, a real Barbudan whose mother and father were Barbudans, and someone who was nurtured in Barbuda, lived in Barbuda all his life, and is now the duly elected representative of the people of Barbuda. So notwithstanding all those who have been speaking, the man who has the locus to speak on behalf of the Barbudans is none other than the duly elected member for Barbuda. Now, Mr. Speaker, we are here today to correct a wrong that was done back in 2007, one in which the then UPP administration had sought to rewrite the Barbudan history. Talking about Machiavellian, Mr. Speaker, it is well known that Antigua and Barbuda is a unitary state. It is well known, too, that the laws of Antigua apply to Barbuda. If you have the provision there in the Barbuda Extension of Laws of Antigua Act of 1859. That's right. Very clear, Mr. Speaker. It is well known, too, that there are certain provisions in this particular act. If you can find this section, Mr. A.G., in which it states very clearly that the Crown has the unfettered right to distribute land in Barbuda the way it sees fit. However, Mr. Speaker, and to quote the relevant section here, under Section 5, Subsection 2, and that is the Barbuda, Barbuda Extension of Laws of Antigua Act of 1859. Section 5 of Section 2. It states that nothing in this section shall be construed as precluding the grant by the Crown of any interest in or over any piece of land within Barbuda to any person, whether or not that person is an inhabitant of Barbuda. So, in other words, the Crown had the absolute right. And up to today, as we speak, the Crown still continues to enjoy the absolute right over land in Barbuda. Now, Mr. Speaker, initially it was the British Crown that had the rights over the land in Barbuda. After we became a unitary state, those rights were transferred from the British Crown to the Antiguan Crown, so that those rights are enshrined in the Constitution. It is well known that the Barbudans have always been tenants in common. No. Tenants living in common. They had no ownership. That's right. Up to today, the Barbudans have no ownership on the land in Barbuda. That's right. It never existed. It is only in 2007 that the mischief was created <laughs> by the former administration in which they stated in that unconstitutional Barbuda Land Act of 2007 that the Crown was holding the land in trust for the Barbudan people. And you know, the distinguished Speaker of the House indicated during a radio program on Observer, not an Observer, on um, ABS television, yes. he said that you cannot ask a trustee or let's say the owner for that matter. You cannot be an owner. You cannot be an owner be a trustee of and still a trustee. Own. So here's a situation in which the Crown owns the land. <laughs> and they passed a law in 2007 making the owner a trustee. Utter nonsense. And we all know it. You know, the member for All Saints, Eastern St. Luke, spoke about the issue of partisan politics. She said, too, that we have given away the Barbudan seat. I'm pretty sure that we'll win it. 
but you have to understand that this issue for my government is not a partisan political issue. Mr. Speaker, we see this as a developmental issue. Now, for the Barbudan people, absolutely for the Barbudan people. And you know too that we did not go the extra mile to make the act totally consistent with the, with the other laws of Antigua and Barbuda. Because the truth is, even this present bill is disenfranchising Antiguans. The Barbuda Land Act in itself was divisive. It created different classes of citizens within the country. I don't know how you could have a unitary state and you make the point that only Barbudans can buy land in Barbuda. And I accept. I accept that that is one of the provisions in this particular draft that must be addressed at some point. You can have a situation whereby you're saying that Antiguans can't buy land in Barbuda, but Barbuda can buy land, or Barbudans can buy land in Antigua. That cannot be a sustaining position in a unitary state. This is not a confederation so that you can have different land tenures. The reality is, Antigua and Barbuda is a unitary state. Now, Mr. Speaker, huh? it's not all fights to fight at the same time, you know. We don't want, we, we, we should be genuine. The reality is, the hurricane has created a peculiar situation in which over 80 million US dollars worth of property damages were sustained from the passage of Hurricane Irma. And as a proactive government, a forward-thinking government, we recognized from the onset that we would have had difficulties raising the funds to restore those properties, to rebuild those properties that were blown away because of the sheer magnitude of the damage and the fact that the Barbudans had no insurance. Common sense told us at that time that we had to put special provisions in place in order to accommodate the Barbudans, to empower them to rebuild. And even some funds that we thought would have, be, would have become available to build new homes have since been literally denied for the purpose of rebuilding new homes. And that's a matter of fact. And I'll get to that issue. But I want us to understand, Mr. Speaker, that, and I made this point here 10 years ago, just this afternoon, I had the opportunity to listen to my presentation during the passage of the 2007 Barbie Land Act. And I believe I was maybe one of about five individuals who spoke at the time. And the truth is, I danced around it a bit because I was asked by the member for Barbuda, he was not the member for Barbuda then, but he said to me, the Honorable Arthur Nibs, that it is such a sensitive issue that he did not want me to deal with it frontally. However, I flagged a number of potential problems. And one of the areas, Mr. Speaker, that I flagged is the whole issue of Barbuda not having a well-developed property rights system. And I made a point, too, that it will retard the progress of Barbuda. And it has over the years. Now, interestingly, and I'm not even sure where I got that insight from, one of the observations I made is that the present property rights system in Barbuda, not only it is on the develop, but it actually supports foreign investments. Not domestic investments, foreign investments. Because the Barbudans not having title to the land, that they are unable to raise capital to develop the island. Which means therefore that they had to rely exclusively on foreign investment. So the very, uh, the very argument that you're making about empowering foreigners, giving foreigners land, if it is that you're saying that the Barbudans cannot get title to raise capital, then where the capital is going to come from? It means, therefore, that the ownership of Barbudan land to develop industry in Barbuda will be owned primarily by expatriates. Well, that is the point that we are making, that the Barbudans do not have the type of cash flows, they don't have the savings to develop properties in Barbuda. And let me make the point here, you know, um, Mr. Speaker. 
if the Barbudans had the capital, Barbudans would have had a lot of small boutique hotels, but they had no money. And guess what? They had no access to capital because they did not own the land. So that the very land tenure itself is encouraging exclusive ownership by foreigners. And Mr. Speaker, you know, someone sent me an article today. The distinguished Max Harris, written by a gentleman by the name of Hernando de Soto, a Peruvian. And he's making the same point here, even though he would have developed it better than I did 10 years ago. And if I could ask your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, to quote from this gentleman who was once considered for a Nobel Economic Prize or Economics Prize. Yes, I will share it to the Parliament. Uh, let me just quote here. He says here that the world's poor, I want you to listen, member for rural west, you must listen and learn. The world's poor, listen to this, very insightful, he's not a traditional economist, but has some very interesting insights, having traveled globally and would have observed conditions in various developing countries. He says here that the world's poor own 9.3 trillion in property, but cannot unlock the potential of this dead wealth, quote, dead wealth, without formal titles and property law systems that endow income generating potential to assets. And he says here, to quote again, if you integrate the poor into the game, they can create wealth. End of quote. And he says here that in much of the third world and the post-communist Eastern Bloc, huge quantities of land are held by the poor without legal title. And numerous small businesses have no legal standing, making them worthless for loans or in trade, he said. And he says here, when your legal system doesn't work, you can't capture value. Very, very, very insightful. But let me read a few excerpts from his book entitled The Mystery of Capital. By the way, I understand that there are certain individuals who are trying to brand me as a communist and a socialist. I'm a capitalist at heart. I'm a capitalist in practice. <laughs> it's just that I also have a social aspect to make sure that we never forget the poor and the vulnerable. To make sure that every citizen, every resident in this country shares in the or share in the economic gains of this country. Now, in his book, Mr. Speaker, he says here that the stumbling block that keeps the rest of the world from benefiting from capitalism is its inability to produce capital. Capital is the force that raises the productivity of labor and creates the wealth of nations. It is the lifeblood of the capitalist system, the foundation of progress, and the one thing that the poor countries of the world cannot seem to produce for themselves, no matter how eagerly their people engage in all the other activities that characterize a capitalist economy. He wrote, I will also show, with the help of facts and figures, that my research team and I have collected block by block and farm by farm in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Latin America, that most of the poor already possess the assets they need to make a success of capitalism. Even in the poorest countries, the poor save. The value of the savings among the poor is in fact immense. 40 times all the foreign aid received throughout the world since 1945. And he says, in Egypt, for instance, the wealth that the poor have accumulated is worth 55 times as much as the sum of all direct foreign investment ever recorded there, included, or including the Suez Canal and the Aswan Dam. In Haiti, a little closer to home, he says the poorest nation in Latin America, the total assets of the poor are more than 150 times greater than all the foreign investment received since Haiti's independence in France in 1804. Goes on, 
If the United States were to hike its foreign aid budget to the level recommended by the United Nations, 0.7% of national income, it would take the richest country on earth more than 150 years to transfer to the world's poor resources equal to those they already possess. Goes on that they could hold these resources in defective forms. Houses built on land whose ownership rights are not adequately recorded. Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Unincorporated businesses with undefined liability. Industries located where financiers and investors cannot see them. And he says here, because the rights of these possessions are not adequately documented, these assets cannot readily be turned into capital. They cannot be traded outside of a narrow local or narrow local circles where people know and trust each other. And it cannot be used as collateral for a loan and cannot be used as a share against an investment. You understand what's happening in Barbuda? What we've been doing over the years is that we have been perpetuating on the development by not having a proper or well-defined property rights system. An observation that I made 10 years ago. It continues. In the West, by contrast, Every parcel of land, every building, every piece of equipment or store of inventory is represented in a property document that is the visible sign of a vast hidden process that connects all these assets to the rest of the economy. Thanks to this representational process, assets can lead an invisible, parallel life alongside their material existence. They can be used as collateral for credit, and the single most important source of funds for new businesses in the United States is a mortgage on the entrepreneur's house. Can you imagine what's happening in Barbuda? Not even to start a business, because they have the title, and you all keep fooling them and telling them how they have title, and it's not true. You must stop it. It is the members on the other side who are playing cheap political politics. Now, he says here, Mr. Speaker, these assets can also provide a link to the owner's credit history and accountable address for the collection of debts and taxes, the basis for the creation of reliable and universal public utilities, and a foundation for the creation of securities like mortgage-backed bonds that can then be rediscounted and sold in a secondary market. By this process, the West injects life into assets and makes them general or makes them generate capital. What the other artists say, Mr. Speaker, is that a country like uh, Barbuda, the assets are what you call dead assets, generating no wealth whatsoever for the residents and for the citizens of Barbuda. That is what you're promoting. We're saying no way. This government will empower the people of Barbuda. We will give them ownership that they never had. And let us understand that with all the fat chat all of them have, they have gone to the international community, they have made all sorts of spurious claim, or claims, Bring the evidence to show that the Barbudans own any land in Barbuda. Not even one square inch of land, any Barbudan, dead or alive, ever owned in Barbuda. Totally untrue. We're not saying that there's any issue about eviction. By the way, we do accept, we accept that the Barbudans have an equitable interest in the land, haven't occupied the land for hundreds of years but they have no formal legal interest in the land. None. Zero. Never did. It is the Labour Party government and the representative, or through the representative of Barbuda, who will give them title to the land. Now, we have made a point, Mr. Speaker. Those who want to continue to live in this informal system of ownership in common can continue to do so. Nobody's challenging them with their foolishness. All we're saying here, the enlightened ones, of which I understand we have nearly 100 of them, between 75 and 100, who have formally applied already, they must be given the opportunity to own a parcel of land and to have their title deed, to go to the bank, to start a little hairdressing shop, to borrow to send their children to university, just as how Antiguans can do that in Antigua, Barbudans must be able to do that in Barbuda. How are they going to do it now in the title? How? Not even lease all they have. They just build informally on the land 
and nothing exists. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. What we're doing here is that we're transforming dead assets into act active assets to work for the Barbudan people. And you are trying to keep them in the dark ages for political reasons. You know, Mr. Speaker, this is not even a contentious issue. Where is the evidence? And I know both of the members on the other side will speak. Well, when you speak, tell the nation about the authority. Which authority are you relying upon to confirm that the Barbudans own Barbudan Common? It never existed. You tried to enshrine it in the law in 2007. We are here now to correct it because it was a myth that you enshrined in law. And all you did was to create further mischief and to keep the Barbudans in the dark. Now, it is, it is ironic that they created this so-called ownership in common in 2007. And you could not transfer any title to them. What kind of utter nonsense is that? And you want my government to perpetuate that, to keep the people of Barbuda in the dark, to have a situation in which Antiguans can go to the bank, they can borrow for entrepreneurial purposes, to build their homes, to educate their children, and you're telling me that that opportunity should not be available to the Barbudans? So guess what? It's a policy of dependency and ignorance that you are perpetuating, and we're saying that must come to an end. And all the right-thinking Barbudans must understand, we're not here to grab nothing. I have enough land in Antigua. I don't want Barbuda land. Make that abundantly clear. But the issue is here, and by the way, you know, this is not even a divisive issue. This issue should bring the country closer together. Because the Barbudans must understand that it is a unitary state. A unitary state? One country, one people. One government. One government, one land system. Not to have different land systems. It's not a federation or confederation. A unitary state comprising Antigua and Barbuda and Redonda. Look in the Constitution, Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Come on, man. In this house for so long. You ought to know that. Can you imagine that? Asking where you find that. Can you pull that off for me? Let me read it to the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Since the leader of the opposition is not aware, let me at least advise. The first one, you know. Says that Antigua and Barbuda is a unitary democratic state, even without reading it. Let me see what he says now. Can you imagine that? Chapter 1. As I said, you know, you saw to rewrite history in 2007 for partisan political reasons. So, Speaker, for the benefit for the member for St. John's Rural West, it says here. Antigua and Barbuda shall be a unitary, sovereign, democratic state. It continues on the subsection 2. The territory of Antigua and Barbuda shall comprise the islands of Antigua and Barbuda and Redonda and all other areas that were comprised in Antigua on 31st October 1981, together with such other areas as may be declared by the Act of Parliament to form part of the territory of Antigua and Barbuda. And... Let me remind the honorable member as well, and this is on the section two. It says here that this constitution is the supreme law of Antigua and Barbuda. And subject to the provisions of this constitution, if any other law is inconsistent with the constitution, this constitution shall prevail, and the other law shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. What we sought to do was to remove the inconsistent provisions that are inconsistent with the constitution of the country. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, <clears throat> truth be told, this matter is really a settled matter, you know, settled by law. Because the Barbuda Council has been to court on numerous occasions. And on each occasion, Mr. Speaker, they have lost. I'll give a typical example. In interest of time, I will not spend a lot of time on this, but I'm referring to the Court of Appeal judgment, the Attorney General and the Barbie the Council. And this judgment was given, well, the appeal number is 7 of 2001. Mr. So Speaker, 
I'm just going to go straight to the conclusion. There are many other cases involving Sanko and Unicorn and so on. And in different years, from about 1999, every time they go to the court, Mr. Speaker, they would have lost. I think on one occasion they probably got a perverted decision, which was challenged, and the appeals court actually reversed the decision and ruled in favor of the Crown. And since then, they have not challenged the provisions or the ruling in this particular case. But I want to refer, and I'll have a copy made available to the Parliament, Mr. Speaker, on page 25 of this judgment. It says here, and just in case they would like to know who the lordships were, you had the Honorable Sir Dennis Byron, and you had, uh, he was a Chief Justice, and you had um, Judge Singh as well as Judge Redhead. And as you know, Justice Byron is now the head of the president of the, president of the CCJ. Mr. Speaker, on the paragraph 81, it says, it says, and this is the Chief Justice writing here, I would now surmise my answers to this issue raised on this appeal, and the appeal was whether or not the Crown had control of the land in Barbuda. It says, the law is that the Crown, as the owner of land, has the power to grant, including the power to lease lands on the island of Barbuda. The laws, in my view, are equally clear that the council has no role in the transfer of title. There is no requirement in the Barbuda Act, nor the Local Government Act, nor in any other act requiring the Crown to first obtain the consent or approval of the Barbuda Council before exercising its power to grant any land. And that is why we took out the requirement for consent. It was mischievously placed in the 2007 Act to fetter the power of the Cabinet, to fetter the power of the Crown, and we said, but this is unacceptable. The council cannot, I said consent. I never said consultation. Consent. Listen. Consent. So you can have a situation which an inferior body, the Barbie, the council, generating more power than the cabinet and the governor general on behalf of the crown and saying that they must first seek their permission and to grant land consent. that is vested in the crown. So, we have taken a position that it cannot be that way. Yes, we'll consult. And when I speak to some of the provisions in the bill, Mr. Speaker, you'll see very clearly that there's still a role for the Barbuda Council in the management and the administration of land in Barbuda. And that there is a requirement for consultations in the act itself or in the bill which will become an act. Now, the judgment continues, Mr. Speaker, as follows. The council had no legal or other interest in the land contained in the grant of the lease, the unicorn. Neither did the council have any legal or constitutional status in the process of granting an interest in land to anyone. So in other words, Mr. Speaker, the Barbie, the council cannot grant any land to anybody because they don't own the land. The land is vested in the crown. And by the way, you know, this is not something that we're changing. You know, that is what exists today. So this idea that we're taking from them we can't take from them what they don't have. And that we are grabbing. You're going to grab what you have. The crown has the land right now, as enshrined in the Constitution. And even the law itself, case law, would have confirmed that the ownership of the land is in the crown. And the reason why I'm going through this, you know, Mr. Speaker, when the other members on the other side, when you speak, I want to hear your authority. It is not appropriate for you to come to this honorable house and to mislead the public and to say to the public that the Barbudans own the land, that we are grabbing their land, we are stealing the land, and not have any authority to confirm that they own the land. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope that they will heed the call and to quote their authority. If you don't have an authority, then shut up and sit down. Mr. Speaker, I continue. The legislation... And again, continuing with the learned um, Chief. Justice, Chief Justice's um, judgment. judgment, it says here, 2001. That's why you passed the law in 2007, to change the Number law. 7 of 2001. You must stop it. Again, to repeat, the Attorney General and the Barbuda the Council. So, Mr. Leader of the Opposition, Rural West, you would want to listen. The legislation... Again, quoting the Chief Justice, the legislation, as I have shown, 
does not preclude the Crown from behaving as a universal and absolute owner, and in that capacity granting an interest in land. Right. The evidence indicates that the proper processes required by law were observed, and the lease was properly issued by His Excellency the Governor General. In my view, the granting of the lease was not unlawful. Again, this was a case brought by the Barbie the Council, and the appeals court indicated that the ownership, the absolute <coughs> owner of the land in Barbuda is the crown. This is indisputable. Now, Mr. Speaker, let us go back a few hundred years. One of my few losses. One of your few losses. <laughs> but let us go back a few hundred years, Mr. Speaker. He was on occasion. A few hundred years ago, That's why they we the all know side. that the Codrington family had leased Barbuda for a couple hundred years. They leased it. They never owned it. Well, it's for one fat sheep a year. And then they left Barbuda, and then the myth started that the Codringtons left the land in Barbuda for the Barbudans. How could they bequeath to the Barbudans what they never owned? But I have to reiterate it, because some of you have very, what you say, low absorptive capacities. <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, you have a situation in which the Codringtons lease the island, surrender the lease, and therefore the absolute ownership reverted back to the to British the crown. crown. Then we became a unitary state in 1981, and, you know, during the negotiations, the Barbudans were trying to secede. And I have here as well, Mr. Speaker, excerpts from the... <coughs> from the um, Defense and Overseas Policy Committee of the Cabinet, the British Cabinet, yeah. and he speaks to the independence of Antigua and Barbuda. And this is the memorandum by the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs at the time. And I'm just going to speak to some of the issues raised with Barbuda. In fact, they came to the conclusion that the Antiguan people, they were ready for independence, and they agreed. But insofar as Barbuda is concerned, this is what they said. Representatives of the 1,300 inhabitants of Barbuda, which has been part of the colony and subsequently of the Associated State of Antigua for 130 years, have said that they will not go to independence with Antigua. So it's long time, frankly, they're over there farming the fool, you know. And what the common fool people now in 2017? 30 years ago, 36 years ago, Mr. Speaker, they come up with all this foolishness. The British Crown did not listen to them and they're still perpetuating these nonsensical arguments 36 years later. Now, Mr. Speaker, the document states here that the efforts which have been made to allay their concerns and to bring about an agreed solution to their differences with the central government are described in an annex to this paper. The writer says here that I am satisfied that the interests of the Barbudans are more than adequately protected in the legislation enacted by the Antiguan Parliament and by the provisions of the new constitution and that there are no grounds on which we could or should accede to their requests for a separate status. In any event, the West Indies Act of 1967 provides that separation can only be effected at the request that separation can only be effected at the request and with the consent of the Antiguan government. So in other words, they could not have seceded on their own. Should the Barbudans seek to take matters into their own hands before independence and seek to secede, either peacefully or violently, the Antiguan government may be expected to respond appropriately. The maintenance of law and order within the state, including Barbuda, is their responsibility and not ours. Yes, sir. You know what the British government said? The British government say you can't secede without the authority of the Antiguan government. And if you want to create chaos and mayhem, then the Antiguan government has the right to call in the security forces. To act appropriately. And to act appropriately, exactly. So it continues. Barbudans in this country have started a parliamentary lobby in support of their cause. I think we can expect the support of the opposition in Parliament, 
for our proposals for the independence of the unitary state. However, I must warn colleagues that precipitate action by the Barbudans, particularly if it is prompted, if it, is, if it prompted a strong reaction from Antigua, could give rise to criticism in Parliament and abroad. I do not, however, think that at this stage we should be deterred from going ahead with the introduction of the Antiguan termination of association order into Parliament at an early date in the present session. And he says, yeah, I invite your agreement to this course, which I suggest we might discuss briefly at our next appropriate meeting. So, Mr. Speaker, the Brits are very clear. First of all, there's no doubt that Barbuda on its own was inviolable then with 1,300 people. And even now with 1,800 people, it's still um, inviolable. Barbudans, the Barbudans' existence is totally dependent on um, Antigua's success. If this country is not successful, the, the Barbudans will suffer because they cannot live on their own. They cannot survive on their own. We have to pay about $15 million a year to cover the salaries and wages in Barbuda. They generate no income. And you know why they generate no income? Let me go back to the paper. You know the gentleman said, Mr. Speaker, the distinguished Hernando de Soto, because all of the assets in Barbuda are dead assets. So you know what they've been doing for the last 100 and what, 57 years? Straining the Antiguan people. They've got to stop it. And no disrespect to you, Representative of Barbuda. You cannot have a situation where 1,800 people in Barbuda sitting down over there, telling us we must send them $30 million a year, and we don't have the control over anything in Barbuda, in a unitary state? No, man, we can't run a country like that. And you think that you're going to stand over there and make noise and cover this government? We are doing what is right. You think that John Mossington and a handful of people can pick it outside the parliament and cause us to change our mind? Our minds? Well, five and a half. Do you think that John Mossington and those who I shall not describe in this honorable house for the fear of um, reprimand by the honorable speaker could put all of this misinformation in the international press and call us down from not acting in the best interest of the Barbudans? The last article, Mr. Speaker, is one from The Guardian, in which it says here, and this is dated yes, the 27th, it says here, Barbuda fears land rights loss in bid to spread tourism from Antigua. Now, what, what utter foolishness. They, have no right. they had none. The Barbudans had no legal, formal legal rights to the land. It is my government that will empower them and give them the right of ownership. And you want my government to feel as though that we are doing something wrong when what we're trying to do here is to empower those who lost their homes to rebuild? And whereas I never said that we will not help them to rebuild their homes, I have made a point that they must have some skin in the game. This idea that we're just going to give them homes for free can't work like that. Yes, we'll subsidize the homes, and we've been doing all we can to raise the necessary resources so that we can significantly subsidize those properties. But that has been a challenge. At one point, we had gotten the European Union to agree tentatively that the 5 million euros of discretionary funds that will make available sometime in January, February of next year, that will make those funds available towards building new homes. But then they said to us that based on all the negative press, especially in the international community, that they were not prepared to utilize or allow us to utilize those funds to build new homes. We have since asked them if they could give the 5 million euros to UNDP and let them use the funds to repair some of the level ones and level two homes in order to make sure that at the end of the day, the funds are still utilized for the benefit of the Bab units. And they have said tentatively that that is acceptable. But when these individuals continue to plan all of this misinformation, what they're doing here is that they're literally undermining the recovery process. They're making it more protracted. They're hurting the Bab units who require help. And let's face it, over the years, we have struggled to pay the $1.2 million a month in salaries and wages. The former administration one point owed them for 23 or 24 weeks. So it has been a struggle for all governments to subsidize the Barbudans. Where are we going to get 80 million US dollars from? And what is really required is the full support of all the Barbudans, all the Antiguans, for us to raise as much resources as possible so that we can help them to rebuild. 
And you know, Mr. Speaker, I see that ABS just loaded a plan here, which was done by Mr. Chad Knight, is it? Or Alexander? Chad, Chad Knight. Chad Knight. From Bob a Bob Uden. And just to show how duplicitous the members on the other side are, Mr. Speaker, Chad Knight was commissioned by the then Bob Uden Council, which was dominated by the BPM and the UPB government, to do a plan for a new city in Barbuda, or new town. And Mr. Speaker, they went ahead, they did the subdivision, they identified the, identified the land, they did all the zoning, and they actually agreed that they would have done both freehold and leasehold. The former UPP administration. Both of them, both. Can you imagine that? Mr. Speaker, that is the information there. We did not, we did not um, prepare a plan. It was commissioned by the UPP government. You did yes, you by your know. government. You don't know. It's amazing, huh? <laughs> well, see, the member for Central South acknowledges. Your colleague. Dan, Dan, he says, you send him back over there. He says, send him back over you. Minister of Information. Can you kindly get that document published in the Observer newspaper? That is uh, perhaps a publication that I read. As well as an ABS and Carib Times. Okay? Before that, though, let the, let the members of the opposition have copies. Let them have it before you publish it. Yeah, yeah. I will, Mr. Speaker. We'll make it available to the members of the opposition that we publish. That's amazing. You, you remember that? <laughs> Look at it all there. <laughs> we'll get you a copy of your plan. Is your plan, is your plan you know? <laughs> 1976. No, no, 2007. 2007. 2007. Yes. yes. Your government did it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the distinguished member for Will West, he has forgotten. Look at the, look the whole thing there. Anyway, we'll share it with you, sir. But the point is, distinguished member for Will West, you and the members on the other side must stop playing games with the people of Barbuda. This is a time that they need a hand up, a leg up. This is not a time for us to be dividing the nation over the issue of a myth. Because you know deep in your hearts that the Barbudans never had ownership. And you know too, Mr. Speaker, back in the 1600s, 1700s, before 1834, when we got in, um, emancipation. Before 1834, Mr. Speaker, our forebears were chattels. So they had no ownership rights. So even if the Codringtons had owned the land in Barbuda, because they were chattels, they were slaves, the Codringtons would not have been in a position to turn over the property to them. So anyhow you look at it, it is a myth. Total myth. Now, Mr. Speaker, here's a situation which we're saying. Look, you have no ownership, but you have an equitable interest in the land. And we're saying to them, look, where you live now, if you want to have it, even if you're occupying an acre, like Trevor Walker, I'm sure his property and his gas station, they probably about two acres of land. One dollar. One dollar for that. Irrespective of your political persuasion, one dollar. We're saying it's yours. So what we're doing here, Mr. Speaker, is that we are legitimizing the claim and giving them legal title. But again, why we're trying to give them legal title? is to turn those dead assets into performing assets for their empowerment. Let me just go back here to the conclusion by Mr. Hernando de Soto. He says here, Mr. Speaker, that, and maybe I'll just re -re um, we quote the part, they were third world and former communist nations. He says that they do not have this representational process. As a result, most of them are undercapitalized 
and in the same way that a firm is undercapitalized when it issues fewer securities than its income and assets would justify. It says too that the enterprises of the poor are very much like corporations that cannot issue shares or bonds to obtain new investment and finance. Without representations, their assets are dead capital. The poor inhabitants of these nations, five-sixths of um, humanity, do not have things, but they lack, no, they do have things, sorry, but they lack the process to represent their property and to create capital. That is what my government is doing. Giving them the right to create capital by giving them the property rights, to give them title. Yeah, get in the game. They have houses, but not titles. They have crops, but not deeds. They have businesses, but not statutes of incorporation. That's right. And that's the other thing that we have to do, Mr. Speaker, not to anticipate the next uh, bill that will come very shortly, in which we'll be funding entrepreneurship. We must get our entrepreneurs to incorporate from early, because that is another bad practice here in Antigua and Barbuda, in which people continue to trade as sole traders, as joint traders, so that today, Mr. Speaker, we, we have no sink, we don't have a single entity listed on the Eastern Caribbean Stock Exchange. And we have the largest economy. In the OECS. I, I come into that, hold on. We have the largest economy in the OECS. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, a lot of our large businessmen and businesswomen, they do not keep proper records. In fact, one of the reasons, too, why the banks are so liquid and they made this complaint to me recently in a meeting about two weeks ago. That is because whenever these proposals are presented to the banks, then there's no supporting documentation. They don't have any records of their profits so that an intelligent assessment can be made to determine the viability of these loans. It is a bad practice that has to stop, and I want to make the point here that as far as practicable, and we're supporting the enhancement of these businesses, they must incorporate and they must have proper records. They must have some form of um, accountant. Doesn't need to be any sophisticated accounting system, but they must be a good reporting mechanism in keeping with the Companies Act. Because many of these individuals, even for grants, and the Minister of, um, of Trade, the distinguished member for St. Um, Paul, will speak to this issue. That even in some instances where they're given grant aid to build capacity, they cannot avail themselves of the money because they're not incorporated. So let me make the point here, Mr. Speaker. This backward domesticated scale in which we have been operating for decades, it has to come to an end. This is the 21st century, and all competition is global. Little St. Kitts has several entities on the Eastern Caribbean Stock Exchange with perhaps about half our population size. That's because of these bad practices. So again, it is about turning these assets into operational assets, these dead assets into revenue-producing assets. To continue here, Mr. Speaker, the gentleman says that it is the unavailability of these essential representations that explains why people who have adopted every other Western in invention from the paperclip to the nuclear reactor, have not been able to produce sufficient capital to make the domestic capitalism work. So they're making a the point here, you know, no matter how much, no matter how much um, technology you get, no matter how much capital you get, if you don't have a proper property rights system in place to unleash these assets, the potential of these assets, clearly you will not advance and you will remain a third world country. That is now our aspiration for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. When we came to power, or even before we came to power, and we said that our vision is to transform Antigua and Barbuda into, into an economic powerhouse, it wasn't a cliche. That is a mantra by which we live, and we know that we have to do the things in order to transform this Twin Island state into an economic powerhouse. And Barbuda will be a fundamental part of that powerhouse. I hear them arguing about developing tourism, a vibrant tourism industry in Barbuda. Why they shouldn't have one? Why should they come in, be coming cap in hand year after year for $30 million in subsidies when they can earn their own money? In fact, on the basis, Mr. Speaker, that we continue to develop Barbuda, I guarantee you that the rate of growth in Barbuda will exceed any other country in this hemisphere. And secondly, the growth in the incomes in Barbuda 
will be second to none because it's a small category of people and they will get more jobs, they'll get better jobs, they'll grow their income, they will improve their living standards. Now there's a reason why a lot of the Barbudans who are here are not willing to go back to Barbuda, you know. And what is the incentive to go back? Life in Antigua is significantly better. There's more to do. There's greater enjoyment. There's a better standard of living. They are citizens of Antigua and Barbuda, so they don't have the incentive to go back home. That's because life's good in Antigua. Well, we want life to be good in Barbuda too. And this is a pledge that I made, a personal commitment to the people of Barbuda, even before I became elected. A member for Barbuda can confirm that I said to them that Barbuda and Barbudans will be our co-equals. This idea that we will continue to develop Antigua and to leave Barbuda as a backwater country, I told them that those, those days are over. I said to them that Barbuda is a diamond in the rough. All it needs now is a little polishing, which my government has been doing, and we expect to see significant returns in the future. It's not a coincidence that we are presently spending $50 million to build a new airport in Barbuda. That's all about putting the economic infrastructure together to facilitate robust economic growth and development in Barbuda. $50 million. It is the single largest capital uh, project ever in the history of Barbuda. So we can come here and make changes, you know, because nobody can question with any legitimacy our commitment to the development of Barbuda. We have put our money, our government's money, where its mouth is. A few months ago, we spent $9 million, Mr. Speaker, just before the hurricane, and built about five miles of concrete road in Barbuda. No constituency in Antigua can boast that type of um, intervention. Since we got into government, we have not done five miles of road in any constituency in Antigua. In Barbuda, we spent $9 million to do five miles of solid concrete roads. So when we come here and we make these changes in the interest of Barbudans, you can second guess all you want, but the facts are there to show our full commitment to the empowerment of the people of Barbuda. The member for all since East and St. Luke spoke about sympathy and empathy. Why do you think we're doing this? Because we are sympathetic to their cause. Because we are empathetic to their cause. Because we recognize that over the years that they have been relegated, not by by government, let me make that abundantly clear, that they, the Barbudans, under the leadership of the BPM and previous colonial governments have been relegated to practically squatters. Previous administrations never acknowledged the fact that they have significant equity in this land and took the opportunity to empower them by giving them title. That is what my government is now, doing now. And you're telling me that sensible <coughs> people, reasonable people in this country want to shame my government as though we're doing something wrong? We are empowering the people of Barbuda. Give them title that they do not have. In fact, the argument that perhaps some of them should be making is that maybe they should have taken um, all of the families in Barbuda and divide up all the land and give them the land. That's the argument they're supposed to be making. They say, hey, look, we occupy this land for 300 years. Divide the land up. Give the Mossington family, what, 2,000 acres? The Nibs family, 5,000 acres? That's the argument they're supposed to be making. Not a common of foolishness that we're stealing land from them when what we're doing is that we're giving them titles of land that they don't have title to. And to see the sensible, intelligent, learned people, respectable people, people that are supposed to be honest, coming here to spout that type of nonsense. I just hope the member for St. John's Rural West, that when he speaks, that he will come with the facts. Because you can't run country and myth. I hope he comes with facts. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me just wrap up now by speaking about the present situation in Barbuda. As I said, Mr. Speaker, the challenge that we have now is to raise 80 million US dollars to rebuild the homes in Barbuda. Clearly, that is beyond our means. We have tried our best to raise funds. The conference that was had at the UN, it is our government that drove that conference, that rallied the international community, 
that got them together not only for Barbuda but for Dominica and other countries within this region. Unfortunately, the total amount that we are likely to get from those proceeds may be about 30 million US, if that much. And there's a difference between a pledge and getting funds in your hands because of that $30 million in pledge at that UN conference up to this day. There's no mechanism to tell us exactly how and when we're going to collect it. And that may take several more months. In the meantime, the Barbudans need assistance. I have reported to this Honorable House on several occasions and on radio that the government of Antigua and Barbuda has collected about 10 million EC dollars. Most of it is already spent. Just on a monthly basis, Mr. Speaker, it's costing us at least $1.5 million just to feed the Barbudans alone. You do the math. In three months, it would have been four and a half million, almost five million dollars spent on food for the Barbudans. We have to pay rent. We know about the recent situation with um, Anchorage Hotel. 45 Barbudans are um, staying there. Who do you think has to pay the tab? Is the government of Antigua and Barbuda the same nods that has to pay them every month to clean up Barbuda? Millions of dollars. The truth is, Mr. Speaker, the $10 million is not even sufficient to meet the current obligations. Because I'm told that recently that some of the truck operators came back over to Antigua because they cannot get paid on time. We have problems funding the whole recovery aspect. So, so far, I'm told about, well, over 50 homes have been repaired. But unfortunately, the Barbudans are still here. They're not moving back home. We have a problem there. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I have suspect that we will lose maybe about 30% of the Barbudan population now going back home. Many of them have said so to me, that they're not going back to Barbuda. Some of them have a second job here and still getting paid by the council. At some point, we'll have to address that issue. Personally, Mr. Speaker, I would have signed no less than about 40 duty frees for new brand vehicles, primarily from Hany Motors, for the Barbudans. 40. An interesting thing, you know, Mr. Speaker, some of the guys them out there who are cursing us, rather than spending the money to fix their homes in Barbuda, they're buying new cars here. We waive everything, ABST, RRC, the duty, everything. Some of them who are cursing us, they were staying at Jolly Beach, <laughs> drinking their cocktails and so on, having fun on the beach, relaxing. And then they send all kind of vulgar information, information to the international community. Staying at Jolly Beach, you know, in a hotel. And after Jolly Beach indicated that they needed a hotel, they decided, hey, we want another beach property. You know where they live now? Dove Cove on the beach. That is what they're doing to my government, you know. And if we were to take a hard line with them, you'll hear, you know, they don't care about the Barbudans. They're going through all this and ray, ray, ray. You have a guy like the, the, the little Barbie, the boy, the name. Which one? The little boy, they just keep spouting his mouth around the place. Ken, whatever she name is. Oh, she is. That's his name, sorry. Kendra, Kendra. Whatever his name is. No, 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 there must no man. Ken, Ken, Kendrina, Ken, yeah, yeah, can't me. Kendra, sorry. Kendra, Mr. Speaker, while he was making all that mischief, was sipping cocktails down at jolly beach that my government had to pay for. Right now, he and Asher, they live down at Dove Cove, Dove Cove at the expense of the government. On the beach. On the beach. They're living better in Antigua than they lived in Barbuda. They have no interest to go back to Barbuda because if things are so bad here, Jack, we go back home now. And by the way, their homes have been restored. Go back home. But they're staying here creating all kind of mischief. But as the member for Barbuda says, it is a handful of them. Generally speaking, the Barbudans are appreciative. They have said to us, do not bother with those, I'm not going to describe them. Just leave them alone. Empty vessels make the most noise. They're looking for attention. The reality is, the majority of the Barbudan people, they know that we are working in the best interest. We hope to have the school completely refurbished. The Sir McChesney George Secondary School within a matter of maybe two months maximum. And I'm told that the airport facility has been fenced and the building has been repaired. I'm told too that the council building has been fully repaired. 
There's significant progress on the Hannah Thomas Hospital. We are making progress. Water has been restored. Electricity is available, but again, for various reasons, they can't turn on the generators because they don't have sufficient load. We need people back on Barbuda. In fact, the biggest problem that is undermining the recovery is that we do not have sufficient people in Barbuda. They need to go back home. Those who have homes, who may not have children in school, who can go back home, should go back home. We can understand those who have children, especially the mothers, that they want to be here with the children and so on. That's fine. And, and we're not necessarily saying that, look, if you don't have a home, that you go back to nothing. But those who are in a position to go back home should go back home and help to rebuild. We need physical bodies on Barbuda. That is the, fun, the fundamental problem we face with. Now, the recovery insofar as the properties are concerned, UNDP has said to us that they will start their program to repair the roofs of the level one and level two properties the third, starting the third week in January. And we're hoping that we'll repair most of them. And hopefully by the end of January, we can start to move over a significant amount of um, Barbudans. In terms of the future, Mr. Speaker, the degree of the resilience or the rebuilding of Barbuda in a resilient way is dependent on how much funds we're able to raise. Now, we're not in a position to borrow 222 million US dollars. We have, we have gotten a loan facility of 29 million US dollars from CDB. In fact, I was told that we had formal approval and we're now signing off the documentations. I just had a call this afternoon that the documents have been sent for my signature. I'll sign them tomorrow. Those funds are to be utilized for infrastructural work, not only in Barbuda, but here in Antigua as well, to repair a lot of the roads that were damaged from the storm. And the 30 million in grant will be spent exclusively in Barbuda whenever those funds become available. We also have a grant facility of $3 million from the UAE in order to make Barbuda green. We have approached them for an additional amount. We've asked them to get us to about 14 million US so that we can make Barbuda totally green. My understanding is that they've given serious consideration to it. And we should have some final word in February as to whether or not the UAE will increase the amount to 14 million US. So we're doing everything that is humanly possible to ensure that the recovery goes smoothly and as quickly, and to make sure that we restore the Barbudans to normalcy, to have them resettled on Barbuda. And even a recent issue that came up today with the eviction, I asked Minister Joseph to intervene. He has done so. So that matter with eviction has been settled. We have said to them until we are able to provide an alternative. There's no way that you know, they can evict them from the hotel property. So, Mr. Speaker, again, I just want to ask for the cooperation of the Barbudan people to understand that the amendments here are to empower them, to give them title, to turn dead assets into live assets that could give, give them the opportunity if they lost their homes, to borrow to rebuild their homes. And, and, and let me make the point here to Mr. Speaker. At some point, the government will have to establish a funding mechanism to provide the Barbudans with some level of support to rebuild, possibly through the Barbuda Development Bank. And what will happen here, Mr. Speaker, is that even if the properties are subsidized by, let's say, 50%, the reality is there has to be a mortgage component. And in order to do the mortgage, they must have title, be it leasehold or freehold. So it cannot be done without title. Let us understand that so that this is for your empowerment. I'll give an example, Mr. Speaker, of a Barbudan who lost everything. There's a gentleman by the name of Reuben James, yes. who operated a nice boutique hotel made out of, I think it was Greenheart. The entire property, Mr. Speaker, was blown away. So he had probably about maybe 12 rooms. He has nothing now. The question is, do we provide this mechanism for him to get a 99-year lease, or do we give him freehold so that he can go and raise some funds, or do we turn a blind eye and leave him out in the cold? And that is why I said, you know, we are sympathetic, we are empathetic, and we're doing all that is possible to make sure that the Barbudans have the option of freehold in particular. And why freehold? Because there's not a well-developed leasehold system on Antigua and Barbuda. Banks, generally speaking, do not take risk against leases. 
because there's no secondary market for leases. It's hard enough to sell real estate that is owned on a freehold basis, much as to go and sell a leasehold. So we have to be very pragmatic. If it is that we had a vibrant leasehold market, a good secondary market for leases, as in the case of St. Martin and other countries, of course we would have gone the route of, um, of leasehold. But we do not have that, and you have to go the route of freehold if you're going to give those Barbudans who have been displaced the opportunity to rebuild. And again, I make the point, Mr. Speaker, that what we're doing here, we're giving them the option. Those who want to hold on to the myth of ownership in common, feel free to do so. We're not challenging you. You can stay on your land from now until time immemorial. You can stay from there on your land in, into perpetuity, I should say. However, give those who would like the opportunity for advancement the opportunity for freehold so that they can empower themselves, they can empower their families and future generations. Barbuda will not be left behind under my government. We will do all that is necessary to make sure that Barbudans advance just like Antiguans. And again, as I said, it's not a divisive issue. It's an issue that should bring us together as we work together to deal with one of the most significant challenges that this country has had to contend with. We've never had to evacuate the Barbudan people. We have never had internally displaced persons on Antigua, ever. And I also want to appeal to those who are creating problems, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the very article that I spoke to about, yeah. the Guardian article, and I just read here so you can understand what is happening. What they're deliberately doing is that they are sullying the atmosphere to raise funds. They've gotten onto all of the various funders and have spread their propaganda and it's created some issues. So for example, it says here that foreign governments who have pledged millions towards recovery are unwilling to get involved. DFID, which pledged three million pounds or four million dollars, referred the question to the Caribbean Development Bank, which will implement a US $29 million recovery project. And this is what DFID said. Or this is what the Development Bank said. We'll continue to monitor developments with regard to the issue of free old title in the context of the entire recovery effort, a bank spokesman said. Canada, which pledged $78 million to the Caribbean, also referred to the land issue as an internal matter. The European Union, which pledged $300 million to the region, declined to comment. Now they went further. They say here that Western governments are proving slow to grasp that land rights are basic human rights in land-dependent economies that communities will rightfully fight to the death for. So they're telling the Barbudans must fight to the death for something that they don't own. They're now saying here too that independent land tenure experts, some kind of Liz Alden Willie, told the Guardian that the Barbudans must fight to the death for the land. Now what is that? And it goes on here, any donor, so Speaker, I want to emphasize this, any donor which idly lets his donation for disaster relief be used to dispossess vulnerable populations is party to a violation of human rights and will in due course be held to account for this. This is what they're doing to us. This is what the Barbudan individuals who are used some very choice words, those handful of individuals, which I will not repeat, this is what they're doing to this country, saying to the international community that we're taking away the land. Therefore, they should not provide any funding for the recovery. Now, who do you think they're hurting? You're telling me, members on the other side, that this is a justifiable position. Many of us here have maybe taken probably, what, five, ten years off of our natural lives, working hard, up to maybe 18, 20 hours a day in this recovery initiative traveling the globe to raise resources, and then you have a handful of people who can just go to the international community and say anything, and spread propaganda to undermine the recovery? Is that a justifiable position? I want you to think about these things. Understand that this is not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. It is a developmental issue. You have real people who are suffering, who have no homes, 
people who have no future prospect if we are unable to raise the necessary funding. And that is why certain terms are used so that these people can understand that if they are loyal to Bob Yuda, then you do not take these kind of international positions. It brings no value to them personally. It brings no value to the Barbudans. It brings no value to the nation. I can't appeal to them anymore. As I said, I don't have to demonstrate my commitment to the Barbudans. It is proven. And that is why I can stand here and speak openly on the land issue and do not worry about those who may be offended about whatever sentimentality or myths, myth, or myths that they may have in their minds. Mysticism. Or mysticism, thank you. This is a serious issue that requires <coughs> full cooperation of all. <coughs> I'm begging the member for Rural West. Sir, when you stand up, I'm asking you to speak factually, not based on sentiments. <coughs> when you speak, please quote the relevant facts or the relevant authorities to confirm that the Barbudans had ownership. And if you can't do that, then you ought to say, hey, look, this is just <coughs> mischief. And again, to the Barbudans who are hurting the recovery efforts, I'm asking you please to cease, cease and desist. Because at the end of the day, if it's about politics, we're going to win the seat anyway. Absolutely. Yes. You're not going to wager on that, but I'm not a betting man. I'm a Christian man. So, Speaker, again, I want to reassure the people of Barbuda that they have the full support of my government. What are we, whatever we have to do to ensure that the recovery is as smooth as possible, whatever we have to do to ensure their full empowerment, whatever we have to do to make sure that they are fully integrated into the Antiguan and Barbudan society, they can be assured of the full and continued commitment of my government. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.